the Lord. This is Pastor Hillman. We're getting ready for our Word and Worship Wednesday. Amen. I just want to make sure everyone can hear me. Would you mind giving me a thumbs up or I can hear you, Pastor, in the comments? So good to see you all already. Grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We are here to study God's Word. Amen. The word tells us study to show our self-approved workmen need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Amen. Amen. Get a few more thumbs up. Make sure everyone can hear me before we go right on into the word of the Lord. And if you are logging on, if you don't see uh, your cousin and them on there, go on and forward them over the link and say, join us for this call. We're about to have Word and worship. We're about to have Bible study. Amen. Now, I want to make sure you all get locked in and get comfortable. Get your Bible. Amen. If you're sitting at your table, put your phone uh, on speaker. You don't want to sit with it next to your head because we're about to do Bible study. Get your Bibles out. And we're about to search and explore the Word of God. Amen. Because in them, the Bible tells us that we shall find Him. We shall find Him. Man, good evening, Marshall. My brother, good to see you, man. Glad you're with us for worship on tonight. Amen. Hi, Lana. Bless you, girl. Superintendent Janice, God bless you. Sister Tati, I love you, girl. I miss seeing your beautiful face. Amen. Amen. Sister Olivia, all right. Girl, we're going through the Old Testament. We know you like the Old Testament. Amen. Ezekiel. Lady Brown. My encourager, exhorter, God bless you, Lady Brown. Amen. Amen. Good to see you as well, Sister Stephanie. Love you. Love you, love you, love you. Miss you dearly as well. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to go ahead and get started. For those who are already joined us, amen. Would you mind just simply sending a quick note welcoming uh, your fellow brothers and sisters on this evening as we are connecting via this virtual worship experience. I'd like to also encourage you to share that link or to reach out to some of your loved ones and encourage them to participate in tonight's Bible study. If you know someone that enjoys learning about the prophetic uh, or even studying prophets, we're going through the book of Ezekiel, so I want to encourage you to reach out to them uh, because we're about to go into the word of the Lord. Amen. And so with that being said, uh, my name is Pastor Tyrone S. Hillman Jr. of Shekinah Christian Fellowship right here in the heart of San Francisco. Amen. And I am like many of you all, I am sheltering in place. But as I am sheltering in place, hallelujah, I'm dwelling in the secret place of the Most High God. Amen. And so I send you a greetings and I God bless you from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'd also like to encourage each and every one of you all to continue uh, to just soak yourself and immerse yourself in the worship uh, playlist uh, that is available. I think there's a link also uh, that will be shared with you all in the comments and it's also available on our YouTube channel. On there, you will see Amen. A number of ways to be able to just immerse yourself in songs of worship and hymns uh, as we would continue to adore our great King and Father through songs. Amen. And as we sing to God, we recognize that it's not about our tone and it's not necessarily even about how well we sound, but it's recognizing that we are singing to God. Hallelujah. We're singing to God and that's what our worship does. Amen. So I want to encourage you, amen, to immerse yourself in that worship experience through the worship playlist that's available to all of God's people. Amen. And uh, the next thing that we want to do is we now want to engage in our call to worship. The call of worship is a recognition that God is summoning us, that God is calling us from our respective backgrounds, our respective places. And because we are being summoned by the King, we want to recognize that not only we call to worship, but we are being summoned by the great King in whom we are worshiping. So would you mind just turning to Psalm 100? Psalm 100. Amen. And as you are turning to Psalm 100, I am, I tell you, I am just so glad and grateful uh, to be with all of God's people. Amen. On this night, Psalm 100. And as I said before, because, amen, we are having Bible study in my home, you might hear the sounds of life in my background from either my wonderful children or my beloved dog. 
amen, or even uh, my beautiful bride, my lady, my lady D, uh, my wife of, uh, of 16 years, amen. Almost got the number mixed up, y'all. Hallelujah. Uh, but Psalm 100, she wouldn't be mad at me. She know I love her. All right, Psalm 100, I'll be reading from the King James Version, amen. And if it is your, you know, it's our custom to stand, but because I'm kind of boxed in right now, I would stand with you. And so if you're in your homes, I'd like to ask you to please stand for the reading of the word of the Lord, because we are about to enter into God's holy presence. And the King James Version of Psalm 100 simply reads, make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands, serve the Lord with gladness, come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and enter into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and his truth endures to all generations. Well, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Now, the same way in which God has welcomed you into his presence Amen. I'd like to now ask you to go and greet someone with the peace and the presence of God. Say unto them, grace and peace unto you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. You can do so right there in the comments. Go on and text your folks and just say grace and peace to you. Amen. Marshall, grace and peace to you, brother. Hallelujah. Carson, grace and peace to you. My beloved sister, grace and peace be multiplied to you. For those of you all who have to work at home on this day, I say strength be multiplied to you on this evening as we would go into the word of God. I embrace you with the love of Christ and the communion of the Holy Spirit. Grace and peace unto you. Grace and peace to you. Grace and peace, Sister Brittany. Lady B, hallelujah. Grace and peace, Brother Justice, Prophet Justice. Love you, man. Hallelujah. Grace and peace. Grace and peace. Pooch, Larice, I love you, girl. Big hug. Hallelujah. Give me a shout out in the comments. Grace and peace. Grace and peace to your pastor. I love you. Amen. We got some folks from Texas. Hallelujah. And Constance. Grace and peace to you, Auntie. I love you. I love you. I love you. Amen. Amen. And now that we have all been welcomed into the presence of the Most High God, man, we have done what saints do. We greeted one another. We have greeted each other with the grace, the peace, and the prosperity of our soon-to-return uh, soon Redeemer. And now it is what we want to do is our custom to offer prayers unto the Lord. The Bible says that the prayers of the righteous, it availeth much. And so we want to go to God in prayer, trusting and believing that what he has promised, he is able to perform it. And so, gracious God, we thank you. It is on these days that we're able to call you Yahweh. You are a covenant-keeping God. That, God, you remember every single one of your promises. For your word even says the promises of God, they are yea and amen. And so, Lord, as we are reminded of your promise, where you told us that you would never leave us and that you would never forsake us. And so, Lord, we ask that you would be with us like never before, that you would be nearer and closer to us as we would draw nigh unto your heart. Father, we ask God that you would open the scriptures, that you would unveil unto us, that you would begin to reveal unto us our purpose and our divine destiny in you. Cause, O oh God, in the name of Jesus, our compass to be aligned with your supernatural direction. We ask God that you would continue to cover, guard, and protect the people of God. We also ask God that you would preserve us from illness, grant us favor, the ability to manage all of our affairs, and God will be careful to give you all the praise, all the honor, and all the glory. In Jesus' name, thank God, and amen. You may be seated even in the presence of the Most High God. So, for those who may not have our book and the way in which we have been exploring this study of the book of Ezekiel is that we've been using uh, this particular book by Scripture Press. But the beautiful thing about this particular lesson is that you don't necessarily have to have uh, the actual book in order to follow along. And so one of the things that I have been encouraging everyone who is participating in this is to please Follow along in your Bibles, read the passages of scripture in advance, because I promise you there is more to appreciate, to, uh, to immerse oneself in, and more to digest if you spent time at least familiarizing yourself with the text, all right? And so the scripture, as we say, what we love to do is that it says, study to show thyself approved. A workman need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. 
I remember talking to someone and I said, we have to learn how to read the Bible, uh, not or to read when we read our, our the, the, the scriptures. We don't just read it as a Bible or a collection of books. We read it as scripture. And they said, well, what's the difference? Well, I said, when you think of scripture, think of something that is designed to script your life. And so it's not just something that we can pick up and put down. Uh, we don't read the commandments of God as optional, but as disciples, as intimate and disciplined followers of Jesus Christ, we read the word of God with the intent of scripting our life, scripting our behavior, scripting our emotions. We look to the word of God and as we immerse ourselves in it, we are trusting God to shape reform, transform, and guide us in a very particular direction that is consistent and compatible with the Holy Spirit that lives on the inside of us as believers. Isn't that good news? Hallelujah. So Ezekiel chapter 12, 13, 14, and 15. This is our text. Now, for those that are following along, uh, the title of this lesson is not spectacle of justice because that's the wrong, that's from last week. The title of this lesson is called The Vanishing of Vain Hopes. The Vanishing of Vain Hopes. And we're looking at the passages within Ezekiel chapter 12, starting at verse 1, all the way through Ezekiel chapter 15, verse 8. Now, you know, that's just the, that's a portion of Ezekiel chapter 15. Now, again, I want to encourage you, get your Bibles out because we're going to be reading these passages and I want you to see and follow along with me as we go through them. The author breaks out this particular lesson into three segments. One, two, three, three segments. He titles the first one, the prolong, prolonging the captivity. Number one, prolonging the captivity. Number two, the presence of counterfeits. Ooh, that's pretty good. The presence of counterfeits. Many of us knows what it's like to have real enemies and fake friends. Woo, thank you, Jesus. The presence of counterfeits. And then the third and final one is the prevalence of corruption. And so when we look at those, the outline in which the, the author has broken out this particular section, again, don't believe or feel like you're missing out on anything. I'm just going to read to you all the lesson overview to kind of give us a groundwork, and then we're going to jump immediately into each of the chapters. Okay, so the lesson overview reads this. It says the residents of Judah and the exiles in Babylon still clung to their hope that Jerusalem would not be destroyed. I'll come back to that in just a moment. They refused to believe that God would follow through on his warning of judgment, but their hopes were based on human reasoning and self-centered desires. Through pantomime and spoken word, Ezekiel faithfully reinforced God's message of the certain destruction that was to come upon a stiff-necked people. In the process, he called everyone to repentance. Hallelujah. A lot to break down there, but I think that's an appropriate lesson overview of chapter 12, 13, 14, and 15. So when I think of chapter 12, and when, if you were to look at it, that section, it contains uh, three different messages from the Lord, and they all deal with the inevitability of a second deportation, a second deportation of Jews that would take place from Jerusalem and Judah. That's also in the book of chapter 12. Uh, uh, or within chapter 12, excuse me. And then in chapter 13, we see God pronouncing judgment on the false prophets. Now, God is equal opportunity. Um, he wasn't just saying the false prophets as men, but he was also talking about the false prophets as women. Shande, hallelujah. He's come for everybody. And he was also coming, and specifically he wanted to pronounce judgment on these false prophets because they were responsible for the Jews' false sense of security. They were the ones who gave the impression that they were the people of God were safe, that nothing would change and everything would remain the same. And then in chapter 14, he also pronounces judgment upon the elders because they sought the idols that were within their heart before God. That's chapter 14. And then finally, in chapter 15, uh, this is the first and we're just introduced to the first of, of the uh, of the of three parables, we're introduced to the first parable, where it's designed to impress upon these overly optimistic exiles that there was no possibility that Jerusalem would escape God's pending destruction. Okay, so as we've done before, one of the things that I like to do is I like to tie it all together with a very simple statement, so that we can look at chapter 12, 13, 14, and 15 in its entirety. So when I read through chapter 12, 13, 14, and 15, and then I looked at the author's very brief commentary, I think it can all be summarized 
as Ezekiel challenging the false hopes of the exiles. It's that simple. Ezekiel challenging the false hopes of the exiles. And he wants to intentionally undermine the optimistic rejection of his warning from God. Remember, he is warning them of pending judgment. One thing to kind of break down and just remind you that judgment is not simply about the pronouncement of gloom and doom. When God authors judgment or intends for judgment, it always has a, 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 an ultimate telos, an ultimate end, an ultimate purpose, which is not just destruction, but change behavior. So God is about the changing of behavior. So when God sends out punishment, uh, uh, its intent is to change behavior. It's not just to destroy, okay? So Ezekiel is being used by God uh, to, uh, to bring about change behavior. Now, here's the thing that, that's interesting about this. Exiled people, we're going to spend some time talking about that. Exiled people that find themselves in situations that are unbearable tend to rely upon dreamscapes, pipe dreams, and delusive contentment as a survival mechanism. Let me say that again. Exiled people that find themselves in situations that are untenable, unbearable, and seemingly hopeless tend to rely upon dreamscapes, pipe dreams, and delusive contentment as a survival mechanism. So here's what God had to do. God had to raise up Ezekiel, who was both patient and systematic and adamantly, he would be used to dismantle the false hopes of the people that were living in exile. So first thing is, when you hear me say that God is using Ezekiel to challenge the false hopes of the exiles, we first got to say, well, what is hope? Hope in its simplest fashion is the anticipation of something desired, something desired, the anticipation of something desired. Now, I want to tell you, I wrestle um, with this particular text from a pastoral perspective. Um, my calling my assignment in the earth is I, I have a mantle of hope. Um, hope is a part of my assignment. And uh, I constantly seek to identify uh, what I would call hidden possibilities in Jesus Christ that can be used to advance anyone's life, believer or unbeliever. Hallelujah. And I have seen uh, the strength and the value of hope in the life of a person. When a person is given a reason to live, oh my goodness, there's nothing uh, more encouraging when a person is given another reason to try again after experiencing failure. Uh, there's something about hope uh, that just gives people that sense that things are just going to get better. So I want y'all to know I'm all about hope. Um, I'm about encouraging people so that they can just believe that things can improve, things can advance, things can progress uh, beyond where they are. And so I think it's a good thing. So I'm asked then, when I look at the premise of these particular texts that we're looking together, that Ezekiel is challenging the false hopes of the exile, I have to ask myself, how do we distinguish between false hopes that should be challenged and real hopes that should be embraced? Let me ask that question again. How should we discern and distinguish between false hopes that should be challenged like Ezekiel and real hopes? that should be embraced. How do we discern the difference and make the distinction between deception and dreams? How do we make the, how do we discern the difference between tricks and truth? How do we decipher and identify the implications of whether there's royal ruses or harsh realities? How do we discern the difference between those two and how can we tap into the prophetic that Ezekiel operates in to challenge the false hopes of those that are in exile? Woo, I feel a preaching in my spirit. But I'm here to do Bible study, y'all. Hallelujah. We're here to do Bible study. Okay. So Ezekiel, as we brought out before, for those who are kind of catching up, and so, hey man, I know some of us, this might be a little bit redundant, but I think it's good for us to reinforce the context of the, of the messages that are being shared in, in these particular chapters. Ezekiel is a former priest that has been summoned and called to the role of a prophet while living in Babylonian exile. This is important. Some people have asked, Pastor, can my calling shift? Absolutely. 
We see Ezekiel, who spent the majority of his development being called to the office of a priest. And God shifted him to a place and he became a priest without a temple. He was like a chef without a kitchen. Hallelujah. He was a, he was a butler with no one to serve. And so God had to give him a new assignment that would fit the needs of the people. And so that he need, God raised him up uh, to be a prophet. Now, his name means God strengthens or hardens. So the name Ezekiel means God strengthens or hardens, and he serves God's purposes and his people while being directly impacted by being in captivity. So Ezekiel is not one who is simply pronouncing doom upon those uh, who are distant and disconnected. No, he is right there in the midst of those who are struggling and suffering and experiencing challenge and hardship, okay? And so Ezekiel is known for what we call the prophetic gestures or these pantomimes or these symbolic uh, pantomimes that simply means with his body, he is, he is embodying the word of God, that the word of God is not just what he hears and what he speaks, but he carries it within his entire person. According to Romans chapter 12, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is a reasonable act of service. That simply means God isn't just after the salvation of your spirit, it's after the salvation of your body. Your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost and the spirit of God doth dwell therein. So we can't just put any old thing and listen to any old thing with these divine temples where the spirit of God lives within us. And so Ezekiel models that, you know, the older folks used to say places I used to go. Hallelujah, I don't go no more. Things I used to say, I don't say no more. You ought to have a used to be testimony. Yes, you should. Hallelujah. Because if you don't have a used to be testimony, that means you still are what you used to be. Yeah, Lord. Hallelujah. All right, so Ezekiel, he is remind again, we have to remind ourselves that he is prophesying roughly six years after the first deportation. There's three deportations that takes place as God is pronouncing judgment upon the nation. The first deportation takes place in 597 BC, but it still proceeds. Remember, the, the temple in Jerusalem and the city of Jerusalem still stands. The second deportation will not take place until roughly 586 BC. So here's what's important. Ezekiel is ministering to a people that believes that God's punishment is unwarranted, that God was unjust in what he did, um, that God made a mistake. Ezekiel is also ministering and prophesying to a people who believe that the judgment that they're in is going to end quickly. That what they're in is going to be over in a matter of weeks, in a matter of days. Y'all already heard some of the prophets say, by this time tomorrow, hallelujah, you're going to be out of this. You're going to spend seven times. You spend seven times and all you ended up being was dizzy. But that's a whole nother discussion. Hallelujah. And then they also believe that the temple is indestructible. Again, they place their confidence in the temple and not in the God that abided and that dwelled within the temple. Okay. So remember that. Ezekiel is prophesying to a people who don't believe that the judgment that God has pronounced is going to occur. They have placed their confidence in false hope. So God sends a harsh word because they believe lies. Why does God send harsh words to people? God usually will move in a mode of, of, of gentleness and kindness. But whenever you see a harsh word coming, it's because persons have been deceived and God is trying to jar them loose from the clutches of Satan. Amen. So Ezekiel chapter 12. Now we're going to dive in. Y'all ready? Ezekiel 12. Ezekiel 12 verses 1 through 2. And bless you all who are also on the line. Prophetess Leisha, I love you, lady. Hallelujah. Ezekiel chapter 12 verses 1 through 2. And it reads, the word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, you are living among a rebellious people. They have eyes to see, but do not see, and ears to hear, but do not hear, for they are a rebellious people. God has to tell Ezekiel, they are rebellious people. Why would God have to tell the prophet that? Good question. Hallelujah. God has to tell them that because... The persons that we are about to learn about, they appear to be righteous. They come before Ezekiel and they say, we've done nothing wrong. 
So God had to speak to them and tell them the true condition of their heart. And God says they are a rebellious people. So going back, what is God doing with Ezekiel? God is raising up Ezekiel to challenge the false hopes of the exiles. So immediately, the one thought that comes to mind in looking at verses 1 and 2, false hopes are easily shackled to rebellious people. Who are persons who are quick to hear lies and believe false hopes? It's rebellious people. It's persons that are stiff-necked, persons who are hard-headed, rebellious folk. Hallelujah. And the scripture even says that rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. When we talk about rebellion, that is open, obstinate rejection of God's will and plan for your life. It's not the kind of, uh, of error when a person makes a mistake. Oh, man, I slipped up. Total white lie. No, it's that person that is blatantly misleading, blatantly manipulating, blatantly uh, sowing seeds of discord, rebellious, and they, that kind of person, hallelujah, shows us that they are easily shackled with, with false hopes. What are false hopes? False hopes are these notions and ideas, hallelujah, that have not been birthed in the mind of God, but give people this sense that things can get better without any change. Hallelujah. We're going to go more into that a little bit further. Look at verses Look at verses 15 through 20. Again, even as God is using Ezekiel to challenge these false hopes, remember the goal that God has in mind is changed behavior. Verses 15 through 20 offer, uh, articulates these words on three different occasions. They will know that I am the Lord. Let me say that again. They will know that I am the Lord. So God is saying, I am sending judgment. And at the end of it all, guess what's going to happen? They will know that I am the Lord. He says, listen, there's going to come a time when I'm going to take them from their place of safety and they're going to have to eat their food in isolation and in trembling, in fear. They're going to run to go get toilet paper. There's nothing. They're going to eat their food. Come on, y'all. Come talk to me. Hallelujah. They're going to eat their food, and as they're doing so, they will know that I am the Lord. They will eat their food in anxiety and drink their water in despair. And while God says, when I have stripped them of everything because of the violence that has been in their land, then they will know that I am the Lord. Hallelujah. That's a tough word for people who believe that they're about to come out of, hallelujah, being sheltered in place really quickly. Hallelujah. God says, no, you will know that I am the Lord. Hallelujah. So when you see verses 15 through 20, it shows us the difference between false hope and real hope. Real hope then is rooted in an intimate and deep knowledge of God. So that means false hope permits God to remain on the margins of our desire. A person that has a false hope can have that hope without God being a part of their life. That's a false hope. In this text, it is suggesting to us that when God is confronting the false hope, at the end of it all, he says, I want to replace that false hope, give you a legitimate hope. And the legitimate hope is tied to you knowing that I am the Lord, knowing, having an intimate knowledge that I am the Lord. Can we keep going? Chapter 12, verse 22 through 26, and we're still in the, I'm still in prolonging the captivity. Hallelujah. I'm still in prolonging the captivity. Yes, I am. In Ezekiel chapter 12, verse 22 through 26, here's what it says. Now, son of man, what is the proverb you have you have in the land of is in the land of Israel? And it says, This is what the people are saying. The days go by. And every vision comes to nothing. Basically, what they're saying is, hallelujah, God has delayed his return. We know those street preachers used to stand on the corner and would say, you need to repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And they would say, Jesus is soon to return. And they were saying that in 2000 and 2005. Hallelujah. Y'all remember in 2000, Y2K folks were losing their mind. They said, repent, but Jesus is soon to return. Well, 20 years later, here we are. And so it comes to the point where people begin to believe that just because God has delayed, that God has denied. 
Hallelujah. And so what Ezekiel is saying is that the people keep saying that God says, hallelujah, that this is the proverb they keep saying. Y'all keep saying all these things that God is going to do in our midst, that God is going to bless, and God is going to bring out, and God is going to favor. And there are persons who have become so obstinate, rebellious in their thinking. They believe that they will not have to reap what they have sown. Hallelujah. But there comes a day of reckoning for us all. Hallelujah. So we see that right there in verses 20 and verses 22 through 26. God says, I'm about to confront the preconceived notions of the people. Now let's jump to chapter 13. Chapter 13 is titled the presence of counterfeits, the presence of counterfeits. Now, if you look at verses four through five and it reads, your prophets, Israel, are like jackals among ruins. You have not gone up the breaches in the wall to repair it for the people of Israel so that it will stand firm in the battle on the day of the Lord. So again, the presence of counterfeits. So not only do the people of God have false hopes, but there are peddlers of these false hopes. The peddlers of these false hopes were the actual spiritual leaders. The spiritual leaders were financially invested in the people believing a lie. The peddlers of false hope. Here's how we know that they were peddlers of false hope. They were unable, or matter of fact, let me say not unable, they were unwilling. They were unwilling to confront the conditions that needed to be repaired in the moral failure of the nation. They were unwilling to confront the conditions that needed to be repaired in the moral failure of the nation. And because they were unwilling to confront those issues, it made the nation vulnerable and exposed their weaknesses. It exposed their weaknesses. These peddlers, these false prophets, they had the people believing in false hopes. And this is how you can tell when someone is giving you false hopes, when they don't challenge your weaknesses, when they don't confront the conditions that you know are imbalanced, impure, and wrong before the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. If the person that you call your mentor is offering you excuses for everything you do and is willing to ex ex accept every explanation that you give for poor behavior, they might be a peddler or a false hope in your life. And they might be setting you up for failure because they're profiting off of your commitment to their mentorship. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Ezekiel chapter 13, verses 17 through 18. And then it says, now, son of man, set your face against the daughters of your people who prophesy out of their own imagination. Out of their own imagination. Why is this important? Because it contrasts the word of the Lord coming to Ezekiel. It's showing that. There's a difference between a word that has come to you versus one that has been conjured by you. Let me say that again. Hallelujah. Woo, I felt that in my spirit. There's a difference between a word that has come to you as a recipient, as a vessel of servitude before God versus one that has been conjured. One that has been conjured simply means that I am taking my own carnal fleshly ambitions and I am shaping through my own machinations what I see and trying to attach some interpretation as to what God is doing to it. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. So, what we see right there in verses 17 through 18, and again, as I said before, that God is equal opportunity. God is not only dealing with the false prophets, which were not only the men that were first started, that were first spoken of in the beginning part of the chapter, but in these particular sessions, it's talking about the women. In this one, it says, this is what the sovereign Lord says, woe to the woman who sow magic charms on all their wrists and make veils of various lengths for their heads in order to ensnare people. Hallelujah. It's really talking about a spirit of seduction. Uh, spirit of seduction is about that which makes me attractive. Hallelujah. That which makes me uh, impressive uh, to others. I'm, I'm more concerned about impressing people than pressing towards the mark of the prize of the hard calling of God, which is in Christ Jesus. I've been waiting to say that all week a lot. God bless you, darling. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. And so it says, will you ensnare the lives of my people but preserve your own? Think about what that is saying. 
Rebellious people who are susceptible to false hopes will not have the ability to discern those that are offering false hopes because they are profiting at their expense. Hallelujah. It literally is saying there in verse 18, will you ensnare the lives of my people, but preserve your own. So literally what these false prophets were doing is that these prophets, P-H-E-T, were prophets, O-I-F-I-T. They were profiting off of the people's purchases of their charms, their amulets, their oil, their, their no evil oil, and, and, and the, the wood from the splinter of, of the crucifix and all these other different things. It means prayer shawls and cloths and all these other different things. Praise the Lord. And so they were profiting off of the fears of other persons. Hallelujah. So here we have also the, one of the things that I want to, to consider is that in Ezekiel chapter 13, it indicates, again, by way of an oracle, that there's proof saying that peace is not cheap. It's not easily attainable. And so here's the thing what these prophets were suggesting, that peace can come about without getting to the heart of the matter, that God can bring about peace to a rebellious nature without confronting what was genuinely within their hearts. And so they were proclaiming a peace that didn't require that they would acknowledge their own responsibility. They were proclaiming God's divine intervention without them having to respond with legitimate change. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We're going to come back to that in just a moment. I'm running out of time. we got two more chapters to do. So when we think of the responses that the people of God were giving to his messages, uh, that were coming from the prophet Ezekiel, most of the responses were with disbelief, denial, disregard, and even distortion. And again, they saw the delay of God as a reason to fuel their disbelief. Hallelujah. But here's the amazing thing, and this is what you're going to see in chapter 14, and then also in chapter 15, that secret sin is only a secret sometimes to other people. God sees it. And you know you see it too. We see our sin. Hallelujah. And it's important for us to confess our sin because the Bible says he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Okay. So look at for, uh, chapter 14 now. Now we're going to chapter 14. Now this is the final uh, section from the office called the prevalence of corruption. Now in chapter 14, verse 1 um, Verse and verse one. So now again, chapter 13 was talking about the prophets. Now, chapter 14 is talking about the elders. These are those that are expected to be mature and to model the behaviors of the Jews in terms of their followership of Yahweh. Now, the elders says this. They came to me and sat down in front of me. Looks good. Hallelujah. But remember, chapter 12 tells us God revealed to Ezekiel and says they are what? A rebellious People, as these folks come to sit at his feet, scripture says, verse two, then the word of the Lord came to me again. Ezekiel wasn't drumming up a word just because the people came. God sent the word. He wasn't conjuring up a word in order to give to the people. God sent the word. And here's what he says. Son of man, these men have set up idols in their heart. These same brothers that came and sat at the feet of Ezekiel in a posture that has the appearance of humility and a desire to be instructed, God literally says, these men have set up idols in their hearts and they put wicked stumbling blocks before their faces. And he says, should I let them inquire of me at all? Should I even let them ask me a question? So, you look there at verse five, he says, uh, or actually, uh, I want to, I want to read verse four. Therefore speak to them and tell them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. When any of the Israelites set up idols in their heart and put a wicked stumbling block before their faces, then go to a prophet. I, the Lord will answer them myself in keeping with great, with their great idolatry. Look at verse five. I will do this to recapture the heart of the people of Israel who have all deserted me for their idols. Again, God's desire is to recapture the heart of his people that has been manipulated and seduced by idols. So here's where we got to go. I got to make sure we get this point. Rebellious people 
who can be manipulated by false hopes are those that have idols in their heart. This is demonstrated by what we seek first as our priority. So here's how we can know whether or not we have an idol in our heart. It's what we go to first. Where do you, who do you run to? Hallelujah. Who do you run to when you're in trouble? Hallelujah. Do you seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness? And all these things shall be added or given unto you as well. Or do you go to where you believe that there's power and influence and money uh, or affluence and privilege? Do you go to privilege, power, and potential first? Or do you go to the foot of the king? And here's what God is dealing with with the elders. God knows, I know there's idols in your heart because you've only come to me as a last resort. You first went to the idols that were in your heart. And when they didn't move in the way that you thought they should, now you're coming to me. And God is saying, this is how we know persons. When you know that you are can be manipulated by false hopes, it's when we have idols in our heart. And how do we know if we have idols in our heart? Well, if we don't see God as our first priority, okay? So look at verse, uh, now I'm going to jump to chapter 15 in the interest of time. Chapter 15, verse 1. And probably right about there, Justice would have had a question for me. So, but you can't ask a question because we can jump it in, Justice. All right. Hallelujah. Ezekiel chapter 15, verse 1. Then it says again, the word of the Lord came to me. So again, he's not conjuring the word. The word is coming to him. And then he says, son of man, how is the wood of a vine different from that of a branch from any of the trees in the forest? And then he goes on and he's offering this particular parable, amen, to basically demonstrate, again, verse 8, I will make the land desolate because they have been unfaithful, declares the sovereign God. God is literally pronouncing with this parab uh, parabolic language that you all have been rebellious, you have been unfaithful, and you have been unwilling to change. Now, we got to pause right there. Because, remember I told you when we started that God was using Ezekiel to challenge the false hopes of the people. And then we also asked ourselves, well, how do we discern the difference between false hope and real hope? False hopes should be challenged. Real hopes should be embraced. How do we, how do we discern the difference between that? So when we talk about we're woven into the idea of hope is the real possibility that that which is hopeful will not come to pass. So there's an element of fear that comes along with it. And that's why it's important for us to recognize that faith is not necessarily the absence of fear. It's the kind of faith that overcomes the fear that what we are believing and trusting to occur will actually come to pass. And so here's what I would describe as false hopes. False hope is assuming that we can continue doing things the same way that we always have as an illegitimate, uh, illegitimate comfort, and that is what's found in false hope. False hope tells us we can obtain our desire without changing. Let me say that again. False hope tells us that we can stay the same and our political climate can stay the same. It's all gonna go back to being the same. It's gonna go back to normal. No, legitimate hope, real hope, recognizes the importance that change is a part of the process. If only, only privileged people dream of things remaining the same. Persons who are in privilege dream of things being the same. But if you talk, of the, talk to the folks that's been oppressed, talk to the folk who are uh, considered to be essential but don't earn a living wage, ask them whether or not they want things to go back to being the same. When they have to go out on a daily basis, exposing themselves and their families to the risk uh, of being uh, uh, being touched by this coronavirus. He'll talk to them and ask them whether or not they want our nation, our country, and our world to remain the same. Only privileged people want things to remain the same. Hallelujah. But oppressed people who've experienced oppression, hallelujah, they drain of things being different. So false hope 
is usually found, again, shackled to persons who are unwilling to change. So how do I know if I'm having uh, the hopes that I have are legitimate? Are you willing to change? Hallelujah. Let that sit for a while. I'm going to drink some water. Are you willing to change? Say, so what do you mean? Some of us, you have the hope that you're going to become this wealthy entrepreneur. Hallelujah. But you're unwilling to change your monetary habits. Is that a false hope or is that a legitimate dream? And if you're unwilling to make changes in the disciplines of your life, hallelujah, somebody, it might not be a real hope. It might be a false one because a false hope tells me that I can obtain my desire and not have to do anything different. Hallelujah. God was confronting the false hopes of these exiled people because they were believing that they would be delivered without changing. They were believing they, they could obtain the promises of God without growing into it. I remember people would say uh, um, that God doesn't call the qualified, but he qualifies the call. That simply means that God will give us opportunities to grow in grace and grow in the responsibility of what he has called and created us to do. But the point is, is that he expects you to grow. Just because we got saved with an undisciplined, contaminated area in our life doesn't mean that we're going to remain in that condition and until eternity comes. God is constantly, by way of the Holy Spirit, challenging us to grow, to grow in godliness, to grow in kindness, to grow in compassion, to grow in holiness, to grow in an awareness that even our assignment and the anointing is not for us to be served, but so that we can serve others. Hallelujah. And so false hope is usually shackled to persons who are unwilling to change. So the question that we have to ask ourselves while we are experiencing our own unique expression or um, type of exile is are we going to be the same at the end of this? Are we still expecting to worship God in the same way, coming in with the same attitude because they didn't sing our song or they didn't allow us to sing our song in the choir, whatever that may be, hallelujah. Are we expecting that after our own form of exile that we could just go back to doing church the same old way, doing praise and worship the same way, preaching the same way, giving the same way? Or, or, or do we only see worship as associated with the four walls of the church? Because God has said, I've taken away your four walls. Can you continue to worship? Will we go back to the same way of worship? Or will we allow God to allow, will we allow God to bring altars of worship in our home and then enrich it and enhance it when we have the opportunity to gather again? That's good news right there. That's quite a challenge for us. Hallelujah. And again, Therefore, so I want to suggest to you that real hope coincides and lives with a desire to be transformed. And so if we want to give our young people and our children real hopes, if we're encouraging them with real hope, with the legitimate hope, then we also have to outline for them the areas where they may need to grow in. And so we can look at our children and see in them, I see the potential in you to be, a, uh, uh, to be the next president. But that means we need them to go to civics class. We need them to read the Constitution. Uh, we need them. <laughs> I hear what I'm saying. Hallelujah. These are the things. So we want to give people the real hope. Then we want them to recognize that if you want to live out that dream. Hallelujah. You got to grow in transformation. If you if you believe in God to have this amazing service and salon business, then you can't be one that offers an inferior service. You can't go around uh, uh, diluting your product and adding water. Hallelujah. What, what the, the, the permanent hair? I don't even know what it is. Hallelujah. You can't be diluting your product and talking about how God is going to blow you up. No, you're offering an inferior service and you want to be paid premium top dollar. The devil is a liar. That is a false hope. Hallelujah. Real hope is tied to growth and transformation. Hallelujah. There's some persons, they're like, I'm believing God. I'm going to get married. I'm going to give me a husband. I'm going to give me a wife. All of that wonderful stuff. When are you going to change? 
Where's your desire to change? Hallelujah. You don't even like you, somebody move your cup. You didn't, you didn't, you didn't just went all bad, all bad. How you gonna handle somebody in your space? Brother man, how you gonna handle a wife? You want a maid, you want somebody to clean up after you and to cook for you and to take you to the doctor? No, you need somebody that's going to partner with you and say, you need to change your diet so I ain't got to wheel you around and take you to the hospital every time something's going wrong with your body. you got to make some changes. Hallelujah. And so when we talk about wanting real hope, that means I am saying, God, what changes will you require of me? We've said this many times for uh, our young people. They were like, Pastor, these are my final thoughts. Hallelujah. They're like, Pastor, uh, I want to see the miracles. I want, I want to see God's signs. I want to see God's wonders. And, 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 and I always remark back to them that when you see a miracle, a sign, or a wonder, it's not in, designed to entertain you. It's not designed so now you can ascertain that the, that the God that we read about in the scriptures now exists. No, no, no. After a miracle, after a sign, after a wonder, there's an expectation of change and transformation. You can't go back to live in the same way. You can't go back to functioning in relationships when God has shown you, has shown you a miracle. Hallelujah. That's strange. That's weird. That's a false hope. And so those of us who are asking, where are the, where are the miracles? Where are the signs? Where are the wonders? Well, the question I offer to you is, where's your desire to be changed and transformed? Where's your desire to say, you know what? I can't keep picking careers based on which one makes the most money. I need, make, I need to make a career decision based upon my inner uh, desire to fulfill vocation. How I need to walk worthy of the vocation wherewith I have been called. And so if God has called me to be a teacher to children, I have to recognize that being a teacher to children might mean I'm not going to make a whole lot of money. So that means I have to accept like Ezekiel, I have to embody my calling. I have to accept a financial lifestyle that is consistent with what teachers make and embrace that sacrifice so I can live out my call and my destiny. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Oh, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. So as I think about, uh, again, these false hopes versus real hopes, I pray um, that uh, this would at least encourage you because, again, I deal in hope. Amen. And that's what I want people to do. I want them to be filled with the hope of Jesus Christ. And, uh, and the last scripture. Oh, I almost forgot about the scripture. Hallelujah. First Corinthians chapter 15. You want to talk about hope because all of us have this eternal living hope that when he appears, the Bible says in first Corinthians 15, we shall all be changed. Hallelujah. At the twinkling of an eye. Hallelujah. Even to get to that eternal and everlasting hope, we got to be changed. Hallelujah. So I want to encourage you. You're not too old to change. The only thing that has to stop changing is stuff that's dead. Hallelujah. And if you ain't planning to die, say, Lord, I'm ready to change. Hallelujah. Lord, I am ready to change. That means I'm ready to grow. Look, we're doing, look, we doing a Bible study uh, virtually. I'm in my house. I have, this is a change for me. Hallelujah. This is a change. You know how hard it is not being able to teach. Hallelujah. With the flavor and the impact and the interaction with God's people. But hallelujah. I got to change. I got to grow. We got to do church differently in order to worship God in this new space. Amen. So. Those are my final thoughts. I'm so grateful, so excited, amen. And thank you so much for being with us uh, on tonight. Now, before I let you go, I got a couple of announcements that I wanted to share with you, okay? The first announcement is, man, you got to join us for corporate prayer. We have a prayer line um, on Friday night from 6.30 to 7.30. And that prayer line, it is off the hook. Do they still say off the hook? Off the heezy. Is that what they say a lot? No, neither one of those. All right, whatever. It's it's cracking. It's it's fire. Yeah, yeah, there it is. How it's fire. It's fire. Yeah, yeah. It's fire. Thank God for my team helping me out. It's fire. And join us for prayer. We are just lifting up God, praying, believing the Lord. And so I want you to join us for corporate prayer. Also to my uh, to my beloved brothers, y'all know we have it our 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 men's night. Uh, we're going to be conducting that via Zoom. So be on the lookout for that information, uh, brothers. Amen. We're going to be having our men's service, encouraging one another uh, via, uh, via that particular technological platform. I'm, in, I'm excited about the testimonies and the word of the Lord that's going to, uh, that's going to come forth. Now, I got to tell you this. Let me put this to the side. Holy Week is upon us. 
one of the most significant days in Christendom that we celebrate as Christians and believers is upon us. We're ending, hallelujah, the Lenten season, the preparation uh, where we are reminded that Christ hung, bled, died, and gave his life for us. And so for Holy Week, we got a number of things that we're going to be doing, kicking off with Palm Sunday. This upcoming Sunday, which is Palm Sunday, you know, hallelujah, when he came riding on the donkey, hallelujah, and they were waving the palms, saying, Hosanna, 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 save now, hallelujah. We are going to be celebrating Palm Sunday, and it is also our tradition on First Sunday to break communion, to have Holy Communion. So not only are we going to have Palm Sunday, but we're going to be doing communion at home together. Oh, man. You don't even know. I'm like, I'm so pumped up about this. Hallelujah. Now, for those of you all who don't want to do this in terms of, because here's what I want to ask you to do. I want to ask you to make your own communion bread. There's a simple recipe. Probably takes, what, 20 minutes? Now, I look, I might not make, okay, I might try. I might help. I'm going to get the flour. Okay, that, so about 20, it takes about 20 minutes to make. We want to make our own communion bread. Hallelujah. In preparation for communion Sunday. Make your communion bread. You can do it on Sunday morning. Hallelujah. Uh, uh, and then share pictures of your communion bread that you're making. Now, if you don't want to make it, that's fine. Just get some saltine crackers. Hallelujah. But man, I want to encourage everyone, if you can, man, make that bread because this is going to be an amazing experience that I've never experienced before. And I know God is just going uh, to bless it. So I want you to make sure just for this upcoming, we got Holy Communion for Holy Week. There's going to be so many other opportunities for us to engage as well, all in preparation. There's going to be some information that's on our website. So go to our website, secfsf.org. I think it's backslash Holy Week. So there's instructions not only for folks that have children, but also for us as adults as we would prepare for Holy Week. Remember when Jesus washed the feet of his disciples? Well, that's what we're going to do. We're going to wash the feet, hallelujah, of our loved ones. If you're sheltering in place with your family, you can wash their feet. And if you don't feel like washing feet, you can wash some dishes if you don't normally wash the dishes. Hallelujah. Do an act of service. These are the things that we're going to be doing, okay? And then the other thing that I got to tell you, last, we are doing the seven last things. Dude, I'm so hyped up about this. We have seven amazing and anointed women of God who are going to be breaking bread with us in a virtual platform. That's right. Hallelujah. We are using what God has made available to us, and we're going to experience the seven last sayings of Christ on the cross virtually through Facebook Live. It's going to be off the hook. It's going to it's going to be powerful. It's going to be profound. And guess what? We starting early. It's going to be at three o'clock. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. So, man, we are so excited. I got to I got to tell you, I am so man. I'm so looking forward to hearing from these amazing women of God who are going to bring forth the word. And again, this is the first time hallelujah, in our history of doing this in almost 18 years of having an entire lineup of nothing but women. Hallelujah. Y'all know women were the first ones to be the evangelists saying Jesus is risen. And so I think it's only fitting, hallelujah, that in the celebration of women's suffrage, that women would come and bring the preaching of the gospel, hallelujah, of the seven last sayings of Christ. And y'all know they was the ones that was at the cross too, hallelujah. So it's going to be off the chain. I'm looking forward to seeing these ladies. Y'all make sure you invite your family, your friend, your cousin, all of them, because it's going to be, I'm, I'm, I'm already excited. Man, I didn't went up a whole nother level just thinking about it, okay? Now, again, I want to continue also, stay connected to us on our website, www.secfsf.org. And then finally, I'd also like to encourage you, if you want to give, amen, uh, you can also go and give on our website. There's a, a link to PayPal uh, where you can share with us your, your tithes and your offerings. And uh, and even now in advance, I simply ask, may the Lord add to you some 30, uh, some 60, and some 100 fold. There's so many more announcements, but I can't do them all, okay? And so I want to ask you, amen, those of us that if you're following us, if you want to stay tuned in terms of what we're doing and the information that we're getting out there, the recipes, all that stuff, it's all available online, okay? So even if you, if, if I was talking too fast, like, pass, I can't write it down. It's all available online for you to go ahead and get a copy of it, okay? 
All right. Well, I think that's it. Hallelujah. So now it is our custom, amen, as we have received the word of the Lord. Hallelujah. As we're reminded that we want to continue to grow uh, in our desire to be changed and transformed uh, by the gospel of Jesus Christ and recognizing that real hope is tied to authentic uh, authentic change. We want to grow and change because we can really grow and accept the real hope that comes in Jesus Christ. All right. And so I'm going to simply pronounce the blessing of faith and favor upon you all throughout this week. And so now unto him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us unto him be glory in the church throughout all ages world without end. Amen and amen. God bless you and see you next time. I love you all. Bye, Sister Carolyn. I love you. Hallelujah. Bye, Angeline. Lady B, I love you. Bye, Sister Stephanie. Hallelujah. Bye, y'all. I love you.